morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. We appreciate the presence of those who uh, may be visiting with us. It's always a wonderful thing to have visitors in our audience. And as always, it's our prayer that not only do we encourage you, but we also maybe stimulate some things in your life to help you along the way of life and to stimulate any questions you might have. And so if there's something that you'd like to study further with us, we'd be pleased to be able to sit down with you and to study those things and to um, equip ourselves for those things that God would have us to be. Uh, this morning we have a lot to cover because as our theme for this month is, or for this year rather, is words from the word. And this morning we're going to talk about a word that goes well with what we talked about last week and that Christ was a propitiation for our sins. That means that he was one who was sacrificed so that God's wrath may be appeased and that there may be a fitting sacrifice, a price paid for the sins of mankind and Christ paid that price. Some of that we saw was in Romans chapter 3. We are going to continue this morning in going into Romans chapter 4 where Paul introduces another term that we're going to be talking about and that is the word imputed. So how is it then that our sins are washed away but then we also must be counted righteous because just the removal of sins does not in and of itself create righteousness. As we see in Romans chapter 6 when one is baptized our sins are washed away but that is not enough. We are raised to walk in newness of life. And so we are to not only have our sins washed away, but we are to have righteousness, but it cannot be our own. It must be something that is given to us or something that is counted to us, something that is considered of us. So how does that happen? And that's what we're going to look at this morning. So if you're ready for your three words to see your notebooks this morning. All right, very good. First one is indeed the word imputed. The other two are wages and grace, because those are the opposite ends of the spectrum when we talk about being right with God. One way to be right with God is to be completely sinless, to never commit a sin. But because we have sin, we know that the wages of sin is death. So we can either pay those wages, which would be to die and die eternally, or we can receive grace, which is the gift. God does not, is not going to judge us according to our own righteousness in the things that we have done that we think make us right in the sight of God. We're going to be judged... Hopefully, if you're right, by God's grace and his mercy. And that's why it's an important thing. It's interesting, too, that when you think about Paul's writings, a lot of people seem to want to avoid a lot of his writings because they seem so technical. They seem so legalistic. They seem so hard and and very, very stern in his writings. However, Paul uses so many of these legal-type arguments to define just how important grace and mercy actually are. And we're going to see that this morning as we go through the lesson. There's a lot of reasons to have a study on a word like the word imputed. One is that because it is something that's misused a lot in the world. Some people believe that when God looks at you, he does not see you. He sees Jesus. He doesn't see the things that you do. He sees the righteousness of God. That is not the biblical concept. And that is one that unfortunately has even crept into the church. It's one that's created things such as continual cleansing which means that even if you're committing sins and ignorance, God's grace is like a, uh, the rain that's falling upon a windshield, and God's grace is like a windshield wiper that washes that away is one of the analogies. That is not a biblical concept, and that is not what, what's being taught by the Scriptures. Because of that, it's also led to a lot of misunderstandings about what exactly was nailed to the cross. Was it the sins of mankind, or was it the covenant that pointed out the sins of mankind? That leads to a lot of other different doctrines and false beliefs. It leads to doctrines and false beliefs that would create fellowship between those who are practicing and teaching error when such is not to exist. And so we have to be careful when we start going through, especially terms like this that we don't use a lot, that we understand exactly what they mean. And so we need to understand some basic definitions of a few words. One is this word imputed. It's interesting because the word itself is is an accounting term But when you look at the Greek pronunciation of it, it sounds a lot like, and it's because where we get our English word, one of the places we get our English word, logic from. And so when the word impute is being used in the scriptures, it's being used to talk about something that is reckoned or something that is put down to one's account. But it is something that is done mentally or it is something that is done because it makes sense to do so. When you go through the scriptures, you'll see that this word is translated Uh, with words such as number, that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Some of your versions may use a different word, but some use that word numbered with the transgressors. So think about that for just a moment. 
you're accounting something, you're balancing something out. It would be logical for someone to see Jesus die upon the cross, to consider all the others who have died upon a cross, and to number him with the transgressors. That's what we're talking about. He's put on the ledger account with those other people because that would make sense to do so. But that's why Paul says that's why it was a stumbling block to some. There's other word, ways in which it's used like uh, accounting. I think the O King James uses the word accounting. Count is something that uh, I believe it's the ESV that uses that one to reckon it. That's one of the ones that I really like a lot because uh, the New American Standard uses that one because it takes into account the, the mental part of it and the accounting part of it. And also the word credit. NIV uses that because it automatically assumes that it means to put something to the good, which is not necessarily the case. And so, but these are some of the ways in which it is used throughout the scriptures. When we talk about it, though, we need to understand that it does not mean transfer. It does not mean to attribute to someone else what belongs to another. That's where a lot of the false teaching and misunderstandings come in. Now, there's two other words we need to understand. Those are the words righteousness and justification. Because when you're talking about imputing, what you're talking about is you're imputing righteousness to someone else. You're crediting something as being righteousness. But the word righteousness and justification in our English language seem to be different terms. But when you go through the scriptures, oftentimes they are not different terms. They come from the same family of terms. But we need to understand how they are used most of the time when we read those two terms. And so when we think about the behavior that one is expected to have by God, that is what we generally call righteousness. It's the right doingness, the thing that God expects of us. Another way in which these terms are used, however, is when we talk about the legal status before God. We use that, to talk, the word justification, to talk about that. Okay, that is a lot of stuff on one slide. That's why we have to be really paying attention to how these terms are used and how Paul uses them. Because if we want to get a good understanding of what Paul's talking about, these are three terms we really need to understand. Justified means that you are right before God. But it's not because of works that you have done on your own that you have come up with, your own system of righteousness. The only way for you to be declared righteous before God, to be justified before God, is to do those things that are considered righteousness by God, what are counted as righteousness, those things that are meet for your justification before God. Let's illustrate this with some scriptures. Romans 3 and verse 20. And we saw this uh, last week and mentioned it last week. Romans 3 and verse 20, Paul says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. In other, words, in other words, no one will be found legally innocent before God based upon the law. Because of the law, there is knowledge of sin. But also notice what Paul said in Philippians 3 and verse 6. Paul said, according to the, uh, in uh, regard to the things of the law, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so what Paul is saying is that in Romans 3, I cannot be found innocent before God based upon the things of the law. But when it came to doing the things of the law, I did them very zealously. I was very concerned about those things. And if anybody was wanting to judge me in accordance with the law, they would have to find me blameless because I was one who was keeping the law. But obviously Paul knew that he didn't keep it perfectly because he said of sinners in 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, of sinners, I am the chief. So you see that there's two different aspects that are being talked about, two different things that Paul is considering in these different writings that he has produced. Also in Galatians chapter 3, verses 21 and 22, to understand this a little better, Paul says, is the law then against the promises of God? So you have law and you have promises. Is the law the thing that I can't be justified by, but the thing that I live according, blameless according to, is it against the law? Well, no, it's not. Or is it against the promises, rather? No, it's not. Certainly not, he says. For if there had been a law given which could have given life, truly righteousness would have been uh, by the law. But the scripture has confined all under sin, that the promise of faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. And so what Paul is saying is that if there was a law that God could have given that gives life to us, then that's where righteousness would have come by. That's where justification would have come by. 
But obviously it's not because the law can only point out what I've done wrong. It had no provision for the forgiveness of sins in totality and in reality. The law could not impute upon man righteousness, justification. There was nothing about your law keeping because you did not keep it perfectly that could be counted to you as being perfect righteousness. So Paul says that that's not the purpose behind it. So in Philippians 3 and verse 9 he says this, Paul says, to be found in him, that is Jesus, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. And so Paul is saying that, look, I'm not looking for my own type of righteousness, which is according to the law. For one thing, it doesn't produce it. But another thing that it can do is this. It creates within us a self-righteousness. It creates within ourselves a a self-dependency a way in which we trust in ourselves that somehow I can do enough to make God love me. Somehow I can do enough and be good enough to make God feel like he owes me salvation. That I can somehow make myself feel strong enough and good enough. And I think we identify with this. I mean, the Jews, when they looked upon this, it was the Sabbath days. It was the feasts. It was the animal sacrifices. It was the burning of the incense. It was the reading of the Torah. It was the going to the synagogue. It was all of those things that made the Jew believe that they were part of the family of God and excluded all others. For us, it would be things like eating the Lord's Supper, singing without the musical instruments, um, coming to the church on Sunday and, and Wednesday night. I mean, if that doesn't make us more righteous than others, what would? And so there's a lot of things like that that we hold to that makes us feel like we're going to be somehow good in the sight of God. I mean, we're, we're the kind of people, we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't chew, and we don't date girls who do. <laughs> That's the thing that we think about all the time, is that we try to keep ourselves outside of all those things. And somehow because of that, that's going to make God somehow love me and care for me. And that is not the key. God already loves you. And as we saw last week, Jesus came to be a propitiation not just for your sins, but the sins of the whole world. God already loves you, and God has already made the sacrifice for you. God is not asking for you to keep the law perfectly, but he's asking you to believe in him, and because you believe in him, you want to do everything to make it right with God. I heard an illustration that's not a perfect one, but it's one that I thought illustrated it pretty well. When your kids are small, and they're sitting there at the dinner table, and you put the food in front of them, and you tell them to eat their dinner. And then they say, I'm done, I'm ready to get up. And you ask them, did you eat your dinner? The way that you look at that and the way your child look at that are very different. Your child looks at that as, I put a little bit of food in my mouth, and I tolerated it enough, and I've been here long enough, I'm ready to get up. You look at that plate, and you see all the food they didn't eat. Now, if they are allowed to get up from that table, that's because you show them mercy, you show them grace. But it's not because they ate everything on their plate, as is what you were thinking when you said that. So when we think about our sins, in many ways it's that way, is that we are trying. We're doing our best. And that's going to be different throughout the stages of our lives, even as we'll see with Abraham. That's going to be different throughout our lives. We want God to judge us according to his mercy and his grace because there is no way in this illustration we could ever clean our plate. We can't keep it perfectly. Everybody in here that's of an accountable age, you have already sinned. There's no way for you to change that. There's no way. You have already committed the offense. There's no way for you to clean your plate now. You can't pay the price. You are totally relying upon God's grace and his mercy. And let me tell you, that is a good place to be. That's what the Bible tells us. That's a good place to be. Because you don't want to be judged according to what you do. You want to be judged according to God's grace. Now, there's a conflict that is sometimes in people's minds between Paul and James. <clears throat> and I'm just going to touch this briefly. But, but back in 2018, uh, Aaron did a lesson on contrasting James and Paul. Romans 4 and James chapter 2 and did an excellent job. in in covering that. So I'd encourage you to go back and listen to that lesson that that he brought back then on that. But basically it's this. In James chapter 2, verses 21 through 24, 
you have James who's going to use the exact same quotation from the Old Testament that Paul's going to use in Romans chapter 4. And in James, when Paul, uh, uh, in James' account, when he uses it, he's using it in the context of works and being justified by works. Starting at verse 21 of James 2, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. You may want to underline that and put a note beside it. That is the only time in all the Bible where the words faith only are mentioned. And it says that man is not justified. He is not saved. He is not righteous by faith only. Now, when uh, James is using it, he even explains why he's using it that way. In verse 23, uh, 22 again, do you see that faith was working together with his works? And by works, faith was made perfect. James' point is this, is that if you've been justified by God, these are the things you're supposed to be doing. Because if you've been justified, made righteous by God, it's obviously because you had faith in God. But if you are not doing these things, this is what it proves. You have no faith. Because as the body and the spirit is what create is life, if one of those, those is missing, you don't have life. You have death. And so faith without works is dead also. And so when Paul is using it, as we're going to be seeing, Paul is talking about justification, a person's legal status. What does a person need to do? How does a person become right in the sight of God? James, on the other hand, is saying that after one's obedience to be doing works of righteousness is what's expected if that person has faith. Understanding that will keep you very, very centered and focused on the differences between the two and what they're saying. One verse that harmonizes this very well is in Romans 5 and verse 6, where Paul says this, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, obviously referring to either those who have the law or those who do not have the law, the law of Moses, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. That's a good verse that harmonizes both Paul and James in just one simple verse. It's, it should not be real complicated even though I've complicated it a lot this morning. All right, Romans chapter 4. Let's go to Romans 4. Romans chapter 4. Remember, it follows on the heels of when Paul is talking about the, the Gentiles in chapter 1 have sinned, and so they are in need of God's mercy and His grace. The Jews are no better. They have the law, but in spite of the law, they still sinned. And because of that, they're also in need of God's mercy and His grace. Chapter 3 says God's mercy and grace obviously then doesn't come by the law because those who have the law didn't, didn't keep it perfectly, so they can't be saved by it. The Gentiles would do things that you could actually find in the law, but they didn't keep those things perfectly either, so they can't be saved by some other system of law. So what's the point? All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's what chapter 3 is about. And it teaches us that justification comes by faith then. How so? Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, he's going to talk about their father Abraham according to the flesh. And he says this, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh or in his flesh? The things about he, uh, which he did to his flesh. What did he find? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. So Abraham was one who went about doing those things that God told him to do. But what did he find in his flesh? And that's where Paul is going to introduce this argument. And he's going to talk about uh, Abraham both before and after his circumcision. And what do we find about Abraham? The Jews would have had no problem. And they would have probably stoned anyone who ever accused Abraham of not being righteous and Abraham not being justified. And so when Paul introduces Abraham, it is a very, very powerful example that he is using. And that's why in verse 2 he says that if he had something to boast about, he may have that in front of men. As compared to most men, pretty much all men, Abraham would have something to boast about. But Abraham has nothing to boast about before God. 
really because you were circumcised that, that all of a sudden makes God now owes you salvation because of that? Is that what you're believing? And so Paul is introducing something that would have a tremendous effect. Now he's going to talk about David in the next few verses. Verses 4 through 8. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted or imputed for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. From Psalm 32, he quotes, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven. Notice that first. Whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute sin. So David even talks about the fact that before imputation of righteousness is there, there has to be a removal of sin. We saw from Romans chapter 3, the propitiation, that for sins to be removed is through faith in what Jesus Christ did, an obedient faith that responds to that. And I also think it's interesting here to note that you have Abraham, which would have been regarded as, if not the, one of the most righteous among them. This was their father. This was the one that they looked to as being the foundation upon which the whole nation was built. Abraham. You had David regarded as being their best king, but also one of the kings that messed up tremendously over and over and over again. One of the things that I see from this is that you have Abraham, as good as he was, none of his goodness saved him. And David, as bad as he was, none of his badness God could not forgive. You see both extremes among some of their greatest leaders, but both of them are going to rely upon the exact same thing. It's obviously not good works. It's obviously not a, a system of self-justification, but it is something else. It is their faith that is counted as righteousness. Both David and Abraham both believed God. And because of that, God considered it. God reckoned it. God accounted it because it makes sense for God to do so. It doesn't make sense for God to judge us. As we saw from uh, Psalm 110, God knows that we are flesh, that we are made from dirt. He knows that. He knows our frame. He knows what we go through. He knows it is possible for man to live sinlessly because he proved it. However, he also knows that because of how we are, we are not going to do it. But God still loves us and wants to save us. So it makes sense for God to come up with a different way of judging us. And that way of judging us is this. If you believe that you are totally, completely, without reservation, dependent upon me for your salvation, I'm going to credit that to your account as being righteousness. I'm going to remove your sins by paying the price myself because you couldn't pay the price. And then I'm going to consider you righteous because of your belief in me. Now... The faith of Abraham, the faith of David, but specifically Abraham, is outside the law of Moses in verses 9 through 15 of Romans chapter 4. He says this, Does this blessedness then come upon the circumcised only, or upon the uncircumcised also? For we say that faith was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. How then was it accounted? While he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. You back, go back to Genesis 15, that's where this is, statement is made about Abraham. Abraham's not circumcised until Genesis chapter 17. So before he was circumcised, God pronounced him as being righteous, accounted him as being righteous. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised. So God had not told Abraham he needed to be circumcised, but he was counted righteous. When God told him, you need to be circumcised, he did what God said because he believed in God and that was a seal of his righteousness. Both before and after, he showed himself to be righteous. That he, and this is the reason, verse 11, that he might be the father of all those who believe. Though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those who are not only of the circumcision, but also who walk in the steps of faith, which our father Abraham had while still circumcised. It's interesting that this word, logizomai, imputed, counted, that word is used 49 times in the New Testament. 23 of those times, or 21 of those times, are in Romans. 13 of those times are in Romans chapter 4. 
And Paul is letting it be known over and over and over again that God is imputing something. God is counting something. God is reckoning something. And it's not according to the law. Abraham received this pronunciation from God before he was circumcised. And the reason being is because God was making sure that what we're going to share in common with someone like Abraham is not something you're going to find in the flesh. It is those who share the same kind of faith that Abraham had, both Jew and Gentile, of all. That's what God is looking for. Do you believe God the same way that Abraham did? And if so, God sees you as being righteous. Because if God were to give you back in Abraham's time, the, even though you weren't circumcised, gave you the commandment to be circumcised, you would do it. If he told you to get up from the land of Ur and go to a, ta- a city which I will show you, you would do it. If he told you to go out and sacrifice your son Isaac, the son of promise, you would do it. What's interesting about that is this. Abraham wasn't told to sacrifice Isaac as soon as he left Ur. But it was later in his life. Because the faith was different. And Abraham's faith grew, and it increased, and it abounded, and it became more obedient. And it wasn't based upon him being sinless. Because right after he left Ur, on at least two occasions, he sinned, he sinned by talking about and lying about who Sarah was. And it got him into trouble. He enters into an agreement with Sarah that this promise that God made about this son, it hasn't come true yet, so maybe you should go in with my handmaid, Hagar, and have a child by her. That wasn't God's plan. There were times in Abraham's life where he was trusting in and had faith in things other than what God had said. And yet his life was characterized, though, by believing in God, not by disbelieving. And so Abraham's faith was accounted as righteousness. That's the point that he's making, that that is the thing that God uses. And that's the thing, brethren, that we are going to be judged by. Verse 12 again at the end who also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. That small infant faith that he had. If we have that, if that's what you have right now, that's what God's looking at. That is what God is considering righteousness in you. Verses 13 through the end of the chapter. So what about Abraham's faith? For the promise that he would be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise made of no effect. Because the law brings about wrath, for where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who contrary to hope and hope believed what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old. And the deadness of Sarah's womb, he did not waver. He did not stagger. He didn't trip through unbelief at the promise of God. But was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, it wasn't written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but also for us. It shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. So you see that the way that he talks about Abraham is this, is that Abraham becomes the father of us all because of faith. And it's faith in Abraham or uh, the faith that Abraham had that we emulate when we, as Galatians chapter 3 say, says that we are baptized into Christ because that's when we become heirs according to that promise and become Abraham's seed. When we do something as simple as believing that Jesus Christ died for us, that he was raised for us, that he sits at the right hand of God and will judge us in the end, when we simply bow in allegiance to God in obeying him and being baptized, that is no different than Abraham leaving the land of Ur and the idolatry that's there. It's no different. 
It's the same thing. And it's sharing the same faith that what God has promised, God will perform. And so in Galatians chapter 3, we're no longer slaves nor free. We're no longer male nor female. We're no longer Jews nor Gentiles. Anything that a person tries to bring up to divide us one from another is of Satan and not from God. And it's because we don't believe in God. It's because we don't have faith in God that those things would arise. We are one people. And we're united in Christ through faith. And that faith is what's counted for righteousness. And so he says at the end of that, that these things were written for us, that we might understand the things about Jesus Christ and what happened. God is able to call those things that do not exist as though they do. Not only was Abraham old, a hundred years old, but Sarah's womb also was dead. There was no possible way, none whatsoever, beyond a shadow of doubt, none whatsoever way that Abraham and Sarah could have had a baby except for one way, God. And just as sure as that, there is no way whatsoever any of us can be saved apart from this. None, except this, God. That's it. That is it. There's no system of righteousness. There's no justification you can come upon by some other means. It is God and God alone. But if you have the faith of Abraham to where you would get up from the land of Ur... If you'll travel as a sojourner, if you'll let your faith grow and mature and be time-tested and tried and proven to where even if it required offering up Isaac, that you would do it, God counts that as being righteousness. It's not righteousness in itself. It's not justification by itself. But God sees the faith that requires that. He says, that's my child. That's somebody who believes in me. And I see that child as being righteousness, righteous. And it's right for me to do so because I've already prayed, paid the price for their sins. And it's right for me to declare them as being that way. That's what salvation is all about. Jesus Christ was crucified. God's wrath was placed upon him, it says. That offense in verse 25 brought God's wrath upon Jesus Christ. But Jesus was raised for our justification that we might have life to declare us legally right in the sight of God to be sinless. That's what we're always looking for. So when you read through Hebrews 11, verses 8 through 19, and you see the progression of Abraham's faith, without a doubt, there was obedience that was there. But that obedience meant nothing apart from the fact that his obedience was by faith. If that's what we're doing, brethren, if you have doubts and suspicions, if you suffer from wondering, it all comes down to that. Are you doing what you're doing because you believe in God and are trusting him to fulfill his promise to you? That's what God counts as righteousness. That's where we stand. That's where grace is found, and that's what his mercy brings to us. So the question I'm going to leave with you this morning, you've been very patient as we went through this this morning, is do you want your wages or do you want the gift? When I stand before God, I don't want God to say, okay, so what did you do that makes you think you're right before me? I want God to say, because of the gift that I've given to you, I'm going to consider you righteous. I'm going to reckon and count you righteous. That's what we're looking for, and that's where grace is found. So if you're subject to the invitation this morning, if you want to submit to God in baptism, leave the land of Ur, as it were, behind and become a Christian, you can this morning. Let your faith be counted as righteousness as you continually obey God through faith. If that's where you're at, let us help you this morning. As together we stand and sing, won't you please come if we can help.